troubleshooting no. leakage in the head and utilizing an isolator set. All right, so when we're using these to detect leakage in the head end, we're going to use a pair of uh, units. All right, one's going to be considered the transmitter and one will be considered the uh, detector. And you can see there, it, the process is straightforward. You're going to have a reference signal acquired for the desired QAM channel. And oh, by the way, this only operates with QAM. It does not operate or utilize analog signals such as an analog channel or taggers, OFDM, pilot harmonics, or inserted pilot QAMs. Okay, it is QAM only. Just like with the uh, other detection schemes, we do uh, two times per second. With our transmitter, we solely got an RF source. And in the head in itself, it's going to come off the uh, combining network after the combining network so that we have all the QAM channels available. Doesn't matter if you got your narrow cast in there, but we need it after the broadcast. So uh, that reference signal is uh, transmitted to the detector. So your second unit becomes your detection unit. So that makes sense. You got a transmitter, you got a detector. All right. So your detector unit is going to compare what it's picking up off the air to the samples that it's receiving from the transmitter. And again, just like with the QAM snare uh, scheme, whether you utilize a navigator, navigator plus, if the two signals are the same, then we know that we have detected a leak. So uh, here we show you just connect your RF sample to the uh, F port on top of your uh, isolator. And we show that we'd like to see 0 to 20 dB. That's uh, very sufficient, okay, of input. And again, here we show our detector just receiving its signals off of the loop antenna, obviously selecting the correct antenna uh, in relation to the frequency that uh, is being detected on. The user just simply walks around the head end. they reacting to the displayed reading. So when it, they see a uh, leak being detected, now just like in the field, they're going to uh, troubleshoot that particular location. Okay, uh, the higher the uh, level being detected, the closer they are to the source. Uh, as we teach technicians out in the field, use this loop antenna like a magnifying glass because it's reading the signal that's within the uh, in the loop. Yeah. Just use that in like we do with the source out in the field. Obviously, the higher the reading, the closer you are to the source, and you're just going to look for the uh, peak. Now, remember, same thing in the head end that goes in the field. Don't use it like a metal detector. Don't swing it around wildly, all right, because it is taking samples, and we need like three positive samples. You know, it's about a second and a half, two second lag. Just, you know, dwell over connectors or the location and let it peek out and just move it about slowly. Don't swing it around like it says here, like it's a wand. All right, so menu navigation. When we turn the unit on, it comes up. We'll call this the home screen that you see in the upper uh, right hand corner. In settings, this is where we go to to set up the FSK carrier. So again, we're going to set up the same FSK frequency for each device. Now we're going to set up the QAM channels, same channels for each device. When you scroll down to QAM channel, hit enter, it's going to ask um, the mode and it's going to be QAM. Then we set up the channels. So again, we could set up as many as eight pre-selected channels. In the head end, it's not going to matter. It can be completely independent of what they're using out in the field. Where I've done training, I recommend they try to keep it as close as possible. But however, if they're using an analog signal out in the field, they're not going to use it in the head end. So try to keep it close. Like if they're using a 110 OFDM in the field, but 115 is QAM, then use 115. Use something close. One of the reasons why is because they can uh, possibly use the same antennas as being used out in the field. We set up the channels once all that's set up. And you can see here, set up channel one, then go to next channel. That's going to be two. Set up that frequency until you're finished. Once you go through the number of channels that you want, let's say you only set up three, you'll go to the next channel, which would be four. And I, I think it will say something. You'll get the idea of it. It's something like not used or it gives you a, it gives you a choice where you know that it's not going to be used. And then once all that's done, you just hit exit. 
And now all we have to do is tell the devices uh, whether it's a transmitter or a detector. So one of the units will be set up as the transmitter and the other will be set up as the detector. So it says if more than one comm channel was configured, then select the one you want by pressing the arrow button till, till you get to the uh, required channel and then walk around the head end. Do you recall with the isolator navigator pair when you had the uh, isolator out as the detector and you change the channel, the transmitter follows, all right? So that navigator would change channels. Same thing here. On your detector, as you're walking around the head end, if you change channels on the detector, the transmitter automatically changes. You don't have to go back to the transmitter every time. And that's, the, uh, that's why that feature is there. It, uh, prevents you from having to go back to the transmitter and change. So again, if I went from channel 17 to say channel 61 on the detector, the transmitter also changes. The only thing I have to be concerned about at that point is changing out to the necessary antenna. The trap-like device. So the loop antenna shipping with the isolators will have the high pass filter on it. So we will have to indicate the uh, frequencies for the uh, individual antennas needed in the four regions that ordered these devices. And the highest uh, frequency of high pass filter will be installed on those uh, loop antennas. Noise floor, just the same as we uh, teach guys out in the field. Be cognizant of that in the head end as well, because you know the higher the noise floor of the device, which means there's a lot of noise in the uh, atmosphere around it, can prevent it from picking up low-level leaks. Nothing you can really do about it, except maybe uh, select a different frequency. But if the noise is there, there's nothing you can do about it except just work with what you were given. There is also uh, where you see mode, it says probe. Do not use probe in the head end because it's an inserted signal. It's very similar to using the um, pilot the bomb transmitter, OK? It will put a high level signal and all of a sudden they're going to start getting some alarms. alarms. So caution them. Do not use the probe feature. Troubleshooting. There's really not a lot of issues that you would have there other than no ISM. And why would we get that? Well, it's line of sight between detector and transmitter. So if you're working around uh, cabinets or you go into another section of a head end, then you could lose sight. I mean, I'm sorry, lose connection because it is line of sight. Now there's, you know, we've all had some experience out in the field with this. Uh, you could go behind a tree or something. It's probably okay. But vehicles and other structures will most likely block it. So if they see no ISM, then the recommendation there is to move the transmitter to a different location to where they do have line of sight. And they could use a long jumper in the head end. It doesn't have to stay right at the uh, RF source. So they could use a long jumper to move it around so that they do have line of sight. The other issue would be high noise, as you can see there on the last bullet. So select a different channel. If there's high noise there, go to a different channel and check your uh, noise figure and see if it's better. Okay. And as it shows there, 114, 117, those are those download channels. They should be avoided. All righty. So that is the, uh, that's the end of the, uh, the PowerPoint. So Dave, we're going to use your, uh, your pair. So here I've got my transmitter and I've got uh, a cable coming in from, let's say, a system test point, and my signal level is uh, roughly 5 dBmV. Here I've got a receiver. I've got a loop antenna. It's about a 700 megahertz antenna. I do not have, I do not have the filter in there. Uh, you'll see that the noise floor on this uh, will be a little bit higher. I'll turn on the transmitter, and I'll turn on the receiver. So. The only one thing you need to really set on both, trans both the transmitter and the receiver is going to be the FSK. So right now it's, it's oh, by the way, this turned off in transmitter mode. And because of that, I turned it on, it came in as transmitter mode. So I'm going to shut that off. 
go into settings. I can set my FSK carrier and I need to do this individually for both units. And it's it's a common setting. Just press the button, start to see it flash. You can start to move it from, I think, 902 to 1927 megahertz. Yes. I believe those yes. are the, that's the frequency range. 928, but yeah. 928, 927. And I just want to warn you guys that there's a lot of activity in this band. So if you're not getting a pairing or if you get a pairing close together, but you move them away and you lose the pairing, then be sure to try another frequency. All right, I'm going to exit this. Fairly straightforward. Sound, there's no sound volume control. There's only sound on and off, and it, it will give you a minimum level beeping sound. Uh, calibrator will be factory calibration settings. Uh, and exit. So with the receiver, and I'm going to turn this transmitter on for just a minute. Um, it's just sitting there waiting for the receiver to start talking to it. And you can see that there's nothing there because there's no little ISM antenna showing in the upper right hand side of the screen. So I'm going to go into settings on the receiver, and this is where I'm going to set my channels. There's channel one, channel 17, next channel, next channel, next channel is uh, 106, next channel is disabled. Uh, so right now I'm set up for four channels, and I think, as Johnny said, there are eight, eight. channels available. Okay. Can you hear the beeping? OK, that is coming from the transmitter and the transmitter is saying, hey, I'm not connected to your receiver. So this is just an alarm saying that these two are not paired with each other. And this this occurs after about a minute. This is why I wanted to turn this transmitter on here. It's really trying to get your attention. So I'm going to go over the receiver and I'm going to go back to the main menu and select detector. Now, we're transmitting and receiving ISM. And I'm detecting something on channel 17, QAM. And I just have another loop antenna here. If I get it close to it, my leak is getting stronger or my leak is getting further away. This is just how I'm mimicking moving the unit around. All right. So now you can see that the transmitter is transmitting on channel 17. And I'm on channel one of my receiver. So if I change to channel two on the receiver, the transmitter follows suit. Okay. Channel three, transmitter follows suit. Channel four, transmitter follows suit. That's that's it. You know, now you can walk around with this unit here and you can locate your leak. This unit is going to stay connected to your system uh, test point. Any and I'm questions? assuming I'm assuming that we need to tell technicians because I'm sure they'll do the same thing as they usually do with our other products is that that amplitude reading is not a true amplitude. It's just a find and fix tool, right? Yeah. This is strictly a troubleshooting device, troubleshooting device. So don't get hung up on if you're 10 feet away. For me. Dave, if you, if you would go back to uh, the uh, transmitter detector process. Sure. Transmitter detector. What would you like to know? Uh, just go. Uh, let's turn go back into detection. Okay. Yes. OK, I'm going to turn the transmitter on, turn the detector on. And there you go. OK, so on the screen there, you see your numerical value. That's um, remember we're scanning what is it every half second we need a few positive um scans what you're seeing there numerically is a, a peak hold but the status bar underneath it is real time whereas the uh the uh numerical value is delayed like a second and a half so if that comes up that's what the status bar is for that's just a real time thing okay. and uh but the number is uh is peak for like a second and a half or so what is the noise indication there? Noise colon terrestrial noise in the yep. area. Terrestrial noise. That is the noise being picked up by the antenna 
And I just want to tell you that it's also picking up the noise from the device. This is why you want to have that filter on there. Exactly. So that will improve, Dale. If he had a filter on there now, it would improve that. Now, I just will say that if you put a filter on it, it's going to limit the amount of channels that you're going to be able to receive. That's correct. And that would be better, I guess. Yes, if you're looking at one particular channel. Because I would force them to use the right antenna for the right channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like with uh, out in the field, just realize the um, effective range of the loop antenna that's being utilized in the head end. Um, I can tell you this, just like in the field, somebody's going to see a number and they say, okay, well, when, when do I need to be concerned? Well, when you have a leak, okay, I go work on it and I decrease it. How, you know, if I get it down to a certain number, what, what number is that? <laughs> it's like in the field. Zero. So, uh, yeah, it's, oh, <laughs> ideally zero, but there's some. not going to be necessarily the case in a head end you're going to have noise i mean leaks all over the place you can yeah. minimize you can fix one and still pick up a lower level leak because it's somewhere else within the head end because you're in such tight proximity correct of everything so and just like in the house you know set top box is, does not have the ideal isolation sometimes you can take your detector in the house and you can pick up a leak right over a set top box but right. uh yeah i mean they're going to know they're going to know if they um, if they have a leak and then when they have uh, affected that leak upon repairs. But yeah, ideally it's zero, but it's uh, probably not um, possible in all cases. Do we want to, you know, these guys are going to ask all kinds of questions. I mean, do we want to set 20 microvolts mm -hmm. and under? I no, mean, you, you no, that's not that's not for us to say. Yeah, that's that's uh, for them to say. Yeah. That's just like them saying, OK, out in the field, when do I need to be concerned? Where do I need to start working? Well, that's that level set by your company, not by us. We right. find the leak. You decide what to do with it. Do with it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious. What's the lowest? See, on the isolator, the lowest channel you used to could select was 16. You couldn't select. 15, 14 or 15, is that still the same? Well, we're going to answer that question. 16. 16. 16. And it will ship with uh, the charger, AC charger. All One charger for both units or a charger for each unit? So, yes, it does ship with two power supplies. It ships with the two isolators, uh, the the F81s, two power supplies, and one lant or rubber duck. Frequency must be specified. Mm -hmm. Once that's specified, then that, that that will determine the filter, correct? Yes. And it'll ship with that. Yes. Well, then then it also will determine if they want more more antennas, and then that'll be a separate line item. Comes with one, they may need three. But it's basic, you know. It's it, it's fairly basic operation. Uh, just got to make sure that the setup is correct. Remember line of sight, and uh, they can run with it. 